Matthew 13. Uh, we're going to continue this morning uh, our, our series through what we've called the storyteller, uh, simply a series through some parables that Jesus taught. Uh, and, and so we've kind of identified about 11 of them that we're going to study. There's 40 of them total that Jesus tells. And in fact, uh, we're going to cheat a little bit today. We're going to grab a couple from some that we're not going to study. But uh, in this and in this time, our intention is to show a couple things. So the first thing we said we wanted to show was that the audience that Jesus speaks to is very vital in understanding parables correctly. In fact, what we found over the last few weeks as we've walked through some of these parables is that there are many of them that historically and in modern in our culture and in and amongst churches and Christians and then you can move out past the Christian culture and into the culture of the world that though they may know the parable, they've interpreted it unwisely or incorrectly and a lot of that falls on the fact that we didn't consider the audience well or consider well what Jesus is saying in relation to the gospel. And so um, remarkably simple stories and yet remarkably complex meanings at times. Um, and so we've walked through a few parables that, that really we've had to kind of dig into deeply to understand, okay, what does this mean? What are the implications of this? What is, what is Jesus trying to say here? Today's a little different. Um, in fact, today's parable is, is not all that complex in its theology, uh, but bears pretty complicated practice. Um, so, so it's not one where we will spend a great deal of our time trying to understand the, the truth or the point that Jesus is bringing forth, but it is one where we look at how we as a church are meant to respond to that, and I think we see massive failures in our church, in the global church, and in the culture in the way that we respond with some urgency to the parable that Jesus tells us here. Uh, so, so not complex, but difficult to implement. All right, it's, it's like this. Um, a few years ago, uh, in fact, probably seven, eight years ago now, I was working for a bank. I was a financial advisor. And as a part of that, I had to travel for a week um, down to Ohio. So I was in the worst place in the United States is in Columbus, Ohio, the armpit of America. Terrible, terrible place, right? So if there's any Buckeyes fans... Oh, it was gross. Okay, but I was down there. And so in Columbus, spending my time there, um, my wife and I are, are married, been married for a couple years. I don't, I don't believe we had kids yet. If we did, we just had Clara and she was a baby. And, uh, and so we had bought this house. Uh, as a foreclosure the winter before and so this is like May and we had been kind of working on fixing it up a little bit painting it putting in some floors and stuff we had to amongst other things had to put a new roof on the house um, and so the roof was was old was leaking um, had some rot and some some different things and so there were there were problems there were holes in and amongst and around the roof and so uh, early that spring we had had a bat in our house and so what I learned afterwards was that if you have one bat in and flying around your house you have more than one bat living somewhere in your house and so uh, it turns out that we had a colony of bats living in our attic um, However, I'd seen one, and then I went to Ohio. And so my wife is home in enjoying kind of her time alone, watching TV shows that we wouldn't normally watch together, you know, some little house on the prairie or something, I don't know. But, but I'm, I'm in Ohio, and she calls me, and, and it's the evening, and she says, how are things going? We're kind of talking through the day, talking about things. And all of a sudden, she goes, ah! That's as high pitch a scream as I can muster right there. Was, that hurt me. Holy smokes. So she screams, and, and I go, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? She goes, there's a bat in the house. There's a bat flying around the house. So I'm in Ohio. I mean, it's like five hours. My response was this. Well, you need to kill it. Her response, okay, we're in church, so her response for the sake of this illustration was, I know, okay, there, there may have been some, a little bit of different tone, some anger, maybe some extra adjectives in there, but she said, I know, I need to kill it. I said, well, put the phone on speaker, and so she does. I said, go get, go get a tennis racket. 
and that wasn't long enough so so we came up with a broom so that her extended range of motion I guess a little bit farther and for the next 15 to 20 minutes all I hear is a constant smack and then ah smack ah and from the other side of the phone all I do is go hey you got to kill the bat you see, the, the actual implementation was far more complicated than the what do you need to do, right? It wasn't that complex to say, hey, the bat's in the house, get the bat out of the house. But what followed was 20 minutes of screaming mixed with chasing a bat all around our house, mixed with smacking things, mixed with then afterwards replacing curtains and some broken glass and furniture and different things that got hit with a broom along the way, right? And, that, and then what followed that was me as a husband apologizing for my lack of compassion and sympathy to the fact that there was a very traumatic experience with a bat while I was gone, right? So the implementation, much more complex, much more complicated sometimes than the actual instruction. And that's what we find in the parable with Jesus is the instruction, straightforward. The parable speaks of something as clear and divisive as any that he gives, and yet the implementation of it amongst us today in the church becomes very, very complex. So, so look at it with me, and, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, so pick up with me Matthew 13, verse 24. All right, Jesus presented another parable to them. Hold on, so let's stop right here and, and think about this, right? One thing we said we need to consider in all instances when we're looking at parables is who's he talking to? Who's the audience? Who's, who's this parable meant for? And so in order to understand this one, you have to go back to Matthew 13, chapter one, or verse one, Matthew chapter 13, verse one, because he's just told a parable prior to this, the parable that we studied the very first week, the parable of the soils. And so he's talked to them about these different types of soils and says, not everyone who has ears will hear. And he says this in verse 1, that Jesus was out of the house and was sitting by the sea and a large crowd gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And so Jesus is going to follow up his parable with the soils with another parable to the crowd that is standing here. Knowing that for a large portion of them, a large number of them, this first parable he's told about the soils, they didn't get, they didn't understand, it didn't mean anything to them. In fact, his very mention of it is that not, not all who hear will listen, not all who see will perceive what's about to happen here. And so he tells them another parable with the same purpose that we've said that all of these parables that we're going to look at are ultimately designed to do, and that's to divide, to split those who are right from those who are wrong, from those who are in God's will and those who are out, for those who receive Christ and those who don't, that the parables by their very nature are designed to judge, to sift, to divide, to denounce this universalistic everybody no matter what is okay mentality and to say some are right and some are wrong. And so in some of them, it becomes difficult to kind of discern through this, what does he mean? This one is not so. In fact, look at how he reads it and look at what he says. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Verse 25, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to him, an enemy has done this. The slave said, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, for while you're gathering up tares, you may uproot the wheat with them, allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares, bind them into bundles, and burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn." All right, so pray with me and then let's, let's walk through this verse by verse and we'll interpret what's going on here. Lord, I pray that your spirit moves today. I pray that we um, 
learn your word well. I pray that it doesn't just go into head knowledge, but heart knowledge, Lord. I pray that we are a church that sees and develops a greater and greater passion for the reality, the truth that in this world there are wheat and tares, that some will enter into the joy of their master, some will know you and receive you and spend eternity with you, and others will not. And I pray that that demands a great response from us. I pray that it builds a great sense of urgency in us. So help us see your word well and use it to pierce into our life. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's go back, break it down verse by verse. Jesus, telling this parable, says the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. And so the first question we need to ask and spend just a brief amount of time here this morning, maybe at some point we'll get into this in far more depth, but this morning to ask and understand what what is the kingdom of heaven? When Jesus says kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, what is he talking about? In fact, if you walk through the gospels, oftentimes there's some misunderstanding about what this term, what this concept refers to because you can go to the Gospel of Luke and Luke chapter 9 and and Jesus says that there are some who are standing here in his midst that won't taste death until the kingdom comes. And so in some sense, Jesus is seeming to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's immediate. It now is. It's going to be here now. And yet in other terms and in other senses and other times, it seems as if he's saying that the kingdom of heaven is this future thing is this coming thing, is this thing that will be at the end of the age, which is what he seems to be referring to here. And so let me make a couple points. One, that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are used interchangeably throughout scripture. So as you read the gospel accounts and you see that term, it means the same thing. Now second, here's here's where it gets important. The kingdom of heaven is about the reign of God, not about some geographic location. Did you hear that? The the kingdom of heaven is about where God reigns, not in some realm. That the kingdom of heaven means that it is the reign of God here on this earth. We pray that in the Lord's Prayer, right? That your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That it's about where God has dominion, reign, authority, not about a place, which is why there's no place that's far more holy ground than some other place. Right? That's what, that's what it means to have the kingdom of heaven here, present, now, at hand, is that you don't have to go somewhere special to experience God in a way that you wouldn't experience him anywhere in the Holy Spirit inside of you. It means that God is not more present in a confessional booth. God is not more present in a church pew. God is not more present in nature than he is anytime you are amongst his bride, the church, gathered together as believers. That the kingdom of heaven is about God reigning here on earth. And so in that, it means that it is present tense, but also understanding that it is future tense. So here's what I mean by that. God reigns in part now, but will reign in totality at the end of time. Uh, this, is, this is what Christian eschatology means. And so if you're unfamiliar with that word, it means the study of the end times. And you can watch Christians think and believe and kind of make arguments for a whole bunch of different things about what is to come. Some people are pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib and all these different ideas of what is going to happen and how it's going to happen and what you're going to see happen. However, there's a great deal of consensus on this. There will be a day where there is a new heaven and a new earth, where these things, this partial reign, where the enemy, the devil, still has some dominion over life, is gone. He's cast into a lake of fire and that being prepared for the devil and his angels and those who experience the wrath of God, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes, go and the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem comes in, the glory of the Lord reigns forever and that's the kingdom of God. And so the kingdom of God is both present and future tense. 
And so what we're going to see in this parable is Jesus is going to present it explaining this very thing, that the kingdom of heaven is now, it is the reign of God in Jesus, his death and resurrection ushers in the kingdom, and yet it also looks forward to a time where that reign is completed in the judgment of God and the glory and dominion of God over all things, and there is no enemy on this earth. All right, so, so let me show you what it, what it ends up looking like. All right, verse 25, but while his men, so this man has sowed good seed into the field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. Now, now hold your spot there and skip ahead with me to verse 36. So this is the beauty of some of the parables. In verse 36, it says, Then he left the crowds, Jesus left the crowds, and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parables of the tares of the field. Tell us what you meant here. And he said to him, The one who sows good seed is the Son of Man. The one who sows good seed is me, is Jesus. And the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. Then he continues on. Skip back with me to verse 26. And see that now he's, he's begun to talk about what's going on here. And he's going to talk about now how they respond when they discover there's tares. And so let me... In fact, let me mention this. This is a side trail. We're on a little rabbit trail here. It's not my notes, but we're just going to have some fun with it. You know that tares in, in Scripture, the word there, it's, it's uh, described as a darnell. Now, feeling a little insecure because we're in farm country. I'm not a farmer. Here's what that type of tear looked like. Looked like wheat. When they sowed it, it started to sprout and come up and there was no way to distinguish what was wheat and what was a tear, what was good and what was bad. It wasn't until the wheat began to bear grain that you could see that some of these were weeds, some of these were tares, some of these were darnell, some of these were not valuable. Isn't that kind of the picture that you see in church today? I mean, let's just think about it and speak honestly for a minute that there are many in churches, a part of churches today, that do a great job pretending and yet don't bear any fruit. They do a great job looking the part and not being the part. That we do a great job putting on a righteous facade and yet there is no real depth. There is no fruit. Right? And so, so Jesus says that as this happens, when the wheat, this is verse 26, when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. And then look at this. The, the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And then the slaves say this. Jesus doesn't mention this in his interpretation, but I think I want to show you what's going on here. The slave said this to him. Do you want us then to go and gather them up? He says, uh, no, for while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Here's, here's what I think he's inferencing here. This, this, this desire for us when we see evil, when we see wrong, when we see problems, when we see the weeds, the tares that are sown of the enemy, to want to desire immediately justice. Um, in fact, hold your spot, Matthew. If you go to Luke chapter 9, I'll show you where this, where this shows itself in another spot in Scripture. It shows itself with the disciples. In Luke chapter 9... Go with me to verse 51. Jesus is approaching, it says in verse 51, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go up to Jerusalem. So Jesus is in the north, he's in Galilee, he's heading to Jerusalem, and it says he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. And then it says this, but they, the Samaritans, did not receive him, because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. So they're rejecting of Jesus. 
And verse 54 says, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Can I tell you what's happening here? Um, Jesus is referencing this desire inside of us to see justice now. And that's a desire that, if we're honest with ourselves, have been here and we ask it in questions like, why would a good God let such evil exist? Why does the God of, uni the, of the universe being good, if, especially if we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, his kingdom, why does he allow for the enemy to sow tares? Why does a sovereign God allow for evil in this world? In fact, if you go outside of Christianity and you go to people who don't know the gospel, it's one of the most common objections that they have. How, God, do you put up with such evil? Why do you not uproot now? I, um, I remember a few years ago, it was a Sunday, we went Sunday morning to one of our church locations, uh, it was a, a smaller location, had, uh, well it's about our size, had about 100 people, um, walked in, shook hands with a husband and wife that I knew uh, just a small amount, knew their son better than I knew them, they had a 7 year old at the time, 7 year old boy fun kid. Uh, we had done a lot of like children's ministry stuff together. I'd gotten to know him a little bit. He was a little bit crazy, a little bit excitable. Uh, you can imagine his personality and mine kind of meshed really well. And so shook their hands, smiled at them, said, how you doing? They said, good, good. Worshipped for an hour. Went home. It was revealed to the husband that the wife was having an affair, they began to argue. The argue escalated, and he stabbed his wife to death. I remember the next day, going to the, the county jail, sitting with this man, thinking about his seven-year-old son who doesn't have a mom or a dad now. Looking at him, thinking, God, why didn't you uproot that evil? Why would you allow such evil to exist in your kingdom? Why wouldn't you stop? Why wouldn't you consume these tares, these weeds, these evil ones in your kingdom? And I think, I think the Bible answers it this way. In 2 Peter, Peter writes this. 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count it slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is how Peter answered it. This is how I think Jesus answers that question, is that the reason that judgment comes in the future the reason that the Lord tarries, the reason that we're here, even in the midst of evil in this world, is because of the grace and mercy of God and the desire for all men to come know him, for all to be saved, because as the Lord waits, his mercy reaches into people's lives. And people who have made a train wreck of their lives, people like us who at one time had burned down our lives in sin and self-righteousness and selfish living have been reached by God and saved to come to know him. Amen? And so the slaves come to the landowner and say, be rid of this evil now. And his response is, not yet, for you may uproot the wheat with them. That I am still the reason that the kingdom is now, but that there is a day coming where the kingdom will come in full is because I'm still saving 
I'm still bringing people to know me. And then he says this, allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I'll say to the reapers, first gather up the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather up the wheat into my barn. In his interpretation, in verse 39, it says, the harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it shall be at the end of age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and he will throw them into the furnace of fire and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says here's, here's what's coming. For a time I reign in part, but there will be a day where judgment befalls mankind and the righteous wrath of God is poured out upon all who do not believe, all who were not saved, all who did not call upon me. Friend, the truth is this. The good news of the gospel is predicated, it's necessary, it's based on the bad news for each and every one of us prior to knowing Christ that we must be saved from the righteous wrath of God. Jesus describes it here with weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other places, describes it as worms that do not die, that it's an eternal burning, that hell is real. Do you notice, I, 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 pause for a second, but notice that on holiday weekends or weekends where we might have fewer guests, if you're a guest, I'm sorry, but if we, if we have fewer guests that we're going to preach about things that are a little more intense. And so understand that the reality of the gospel, that a real appreciation of the gospel comes from knowing and understanding the reality of the wrath of God, that God sees sin so seriously that he dealt with it in one of two ways. He killed his son so that you might receive pardon and grace and he created hell so that you might experience righteous, just wrath. Romans 5, 9 says much more than having been justified by the blood of Jesus, we shall be saved from the wrath of God. In John 3, Jesus spreads it this two ways. He who believes in the Son of God has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Parables. Simply do this. They divide. Wheat or tares. Life or wrath. Do you know me? Will you be brought into my barn or do you not and will you be burned? And so culturally a sermon like this, in fact a parable like this, kind of gets shuffled under the rug a little bit because it's, it's not so popular, it's not so well recognized because it's harsh. But it's not that complex. Jesus says there will be a time, well, I have patience and wait for you to know me and then there will be a time where you are divided in my judgment and you will either experience my glory through my righteous wrath or my glory through my generous grace. Here's, here's where my question leaves us. How do we respond to that? Church, if, if this is the truth that many of us know and believe, and I recognize there's some of you in here who aren't believers, who don't profess Christ, and, and maybe you need to understand that this is coming and that you can either appeal to God's justice or appeal to God's wrath, but for the bulk of us, we know this, we believe this, at least in parts of us, to be true. So what are we to do with it? How do we respond and, and I want to leave you with, with two things that I don't think are that revolutionary in thought. But boy, they're hard to do. And quite frankly, most of us don't do them well. Here's the first. Go proclaim Jesus. 
If we believe that the most vital and powerful and, and pivotal truth in the history of mankind is that every human being is eternal and will either experience eternal life or eternal death, will either experience eternity with Christ or eternity without him, then we should go preach the gospel. We should go proclaim Christ at all costs and to the ultimate priority. There should be nothing that supersedes that. And we should go with the expectation that the church will grow. The church is meant to grow as the good news of Christ is declared. In fact, look at, we skipped a couple of verses in between, but look at this in verses 31 through 34 here. Jesus adds some parables to this presented another parable to them saying the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field and it is smaller than all other seeds but when it is full grown it is larger than the garden plants it becomes a tree so that birds of the air come and nest in its branches and he spoke another parable saying to them the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid three packs of flour until it was all leavened here's what here's what he's implying the kingdom of heaven starts so small it started with Jesus and 12 disciples and yet as we see now it's changed the whole world in fact one of the most convincing proofs if you're kind of skeptical about the truth of this whole Christianity thing is that there is no way someone manly would start a movement that was going to change the world the way that Jesus did he rejected leaders he rejected people who were in power he preached against those who had clout and authority and ability he called the people who were the most pathetic of the society he drew sinners and tax collectors to him he called us his disciples sinners and fishermen he picked people who the world had rejected so that as a mustard seed would grow into something big that the gospel the kingdom of God moves forth because of God and so the gospel as we go and proclaim it as we go and preach it is meant to spread it's meant to grow and so we watch as Jesus dies and 11 men go into an upper room now there's 120 in upper room and instantly the spirit comes upon them and all of a sudden the world's changed 3,000 get saved in Acts 2, 5,000 more in Acts 5, Acts 4. And as you watch the gospel amongst oppression, amongst rejection, among, amongst people pushing against it, continues to multiply. It continues to grow. It continues to move forth. So if we know this to be true, we go preach the gospel knowing, expecting that the good news saves. In fact, in Acts, they are so marveled by the fact that this keeps growing, this keeps becoming more contagious, and the men who are preaching it are uneducated, untrained men. They're nothing special. And yet, what I'm convinced is that you see in the book of Acts, you see in the epistles, you see in the gospels, it's a, a people, a group of people who were so convinced that the truth is eternal life is found in Jesus and outside of him rests eternal wrath away from God, that they were willing to go proclaim the gospel at all costs. They sacrificed anything and everything to watch Jesus proclaimed and Jesus move forth. Which brings me to my second point that you won't like as much. Um, we need to go giving up our preferences. You see, the early believers would go at the risk of their own lives in order to preach the gospel. We go as long as it doesn't take an extra 10 minutes of our time. We go as long as the air conditioning's on. We go as long as the music is our style or the decorations are our taste. We go as long as people look like us and act like us and talk like us. And yet when things get uncomfortable, when things get beyond what we prefer, we complain. 
We respond by belly aching. We respond with, with all of the things that we don't like. Because what we are so good at doing is elevating self and minimizing Christ. Is elevating anything we can think of as a priority greater than or superseding the parable that Jesus just told us, which is that there are some who will enter into life and some who won't. Church, how are we going to respond? How are we going to respond to the most foundational, the most instrumental, the most pivotal truth in the gospel that Jesus came to save sinners like us? Are we going to go? Lord, I pray that we will. I pray that we are a people who keep in mind and in heart the great value of who you are. I pray that we're a people who, as we remember just a minute in the Lord's Supper what you did on the cross, that don't simply know it, that don't simply think about it, that don't just have the right answers, but we're a people that would go willing to give up whatever we need to give up, willing to sacrifice whatever we need to sacrifice, willing to love beyond our comfort zone, willing to be a people that would lay down even our very lives for the sake of seeing some come to know you. Because there's nothing in this world more important than your kingdom, Lord. And so we pray you reign. We pray that we bring you glory by going to a lost world, praying for, seeking, and telling them about the good news of who you are so that we might see them come to belief to know you for eternal life. Let's be about that, church. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.